I studied filmmaking in the U.S. during the 70s. Recently, I've been doing talk shows on the voiceless dissidents, those that deserve to be heard but are silenced by the corporate media. The Treasury Department of the present Trump administration sanctioned me and my colleagues. I must have harassed them. We continue the show right here from my home. I am Nadir Talib Zadeh on Nadir's show. On Nadir's show. Greetings. Our guest today is an enlightened scholar of Islamic history in Europe. She is known worldwide as Princess Victoria from Bagheria, Sicily, and we'll be talking about the history of the Fatimid dynasty during the Middle Ages. This censored part of history hides all the knowledge that was passed on to Europe, the contributions of Arab and Persian scholars will be discussed by this unique researcher. Princess Vittoria Aliatta di Villafranca was born in Geneva. She's an Italian writer, translator, and journalist. She has a degree in Islamic law and is a scholar of the Arab world. She is known as the first translator of The Lord of the Rings by Tolkien. In 1970, she began publishing some successful books, inspired by trips to the Near East, Africa, and Asia, with a particular interest in the female status in the Islamic world. Her books, often published as simple memories of travel and customs, contain lucid analyses of the Islamic world. The best known is Harim, Memories of Arabia by a Sicilian noblewoman, published in 1980. Her other books are Baraka, From the Thames to the Pyramids, Raja, in Malaysia in search of lost incense among sultans, magicians and poets. Since the 1980s, she's been committed to safeguarding Villa Valguarnira in Bulgaria, the family's historic home. Hi, Princess. How are you? Assalamu alaikum. Hello, hello, Nader. How are you? Very good, very good. How are you? Thank you so much, uh, Princess Victoria. It's an honor to be able to speak with you. You're in Sicily. You're in, uh, near Palermo in Bagheria. And uh, let me begin with the fact that you are an expert on the Islamic history. And you are in a very important location in the Islamic world where a lot of things happened during the, uh, I wouldn't say the Middle Ages, this is, uh, goes back to a, th a thousand years ago, when uh, the Normans had conquered um, um, Sicily. And before that, there was an era of where the Fatimid dynasty ruled in Sicily. And you have concentrated, why is it important to understand that era and the significance of that era, and why, and why is it so camouflaged in history, where no one, except very, very few people, know exactly what happened, what occurred, what knowledge was transferred to Europe during that very critical time, a golden age. Uh, and so I'd like to start, I would prefer to go directly to the main subject that I'm very passionate about, and I've been looking for ages for someone from Europe, and now you're in Sicily, to talk about this subject. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, let's start from, what you, from one of the main aspects, uh, which is the legacy of this period to Europe. Uh, let's talk of Notre Dame. Notre Dame would not exist if Islamic Sicily hadn't existed. This is the place where uh, Normans picked up from the Islamic tradition, the Ojival Arch. The architecture called Gothic 
It was a word invented by an Italian scholar in the Renaissance period. It's nothing to do with the Gothic. The Gothic architecture is the discovery by the Normans who came from the north of the Islamic arch. And this discovery happened in Sicily, a place where a number of Islamic traditions had met. For 200 years before the arrival of the Normans, Sicily had been the center of the Mediterranean. Palermo, the city they, they turned into a capital, was called Medina. Uh, it was the second Medina of the Islamic world. Such was its importance. This is the place where, in fact, uh, a Sicilian, a Sicilian, probably a Sicilian slave, um, decided to conquer for his, um, for his leader, decided to conquer Africa and left from Sicily and went all the way to the ocean where Morocco, on the, on the coast of Morocco, and from there sent to his, uh, to his ruler the fish from that ocean and then went to Mahdiya to see him and then went all the way to Cairo and conquered Cairo which didn't exist, of course. He conquered Fustat and he created Cairo. It was a Sicilian and he created Cairo um, uh, in, a, in a legendary way uh, through the inspiration of birds which set themselves on this, uh, on this uh, string with bells which they had set up in order to choose the proper day. And the, the day in which the birds set themselves on the string was the day in which the al qahira the planet, was in the heavens. So this man, um, al saqalli was Sicilian and he worked for the first Fatimid Caliph. This is how uh, it all started. It all started from here. It wasn't, of course, the first, uh, it wasn't, of course, the first dynasty, the Fatimid dynasty. Uh, started after a uh, hundred years of Aglabid rule. And this is also very interesting for you, because what was this Aglabid rule? Who, who were the people who came to uh, conquer Sicily from Tunis? They were not uh, mainly Berbers, as most scholars here in the West try to uh, enforce upon us. Not at all. These people were sent by Harun al-Rashid, who chose his best uh, warriors, his Jund from Khorasan, his mathematicians, his enlightened philosophers, and they went to conquer Africa. They created Cairo I, and from Cairo I, they conquered Sicily. So, what arrived in Sicily at the very beginning, and it was a long fight because the Byzantines resisted, it was a refined civilization. The Byzantine uh, civilization created magnificent churches and uh, um, architectures and even coins in Sicily, and they resisted very strongly this first Islamic invasion, um, which needed the, the power and the qualities of the Persian Jund in order to be carried out. And with these people came intellectuals. And I'm sure that one of the proofs of this uh, is uh, not only in the list of names that we still have, because we have uh, magnificent documents dating from later times with the names of the people who, in fact, populated Sicily during the Islamic times, and you have uh, names that are from Persian origin, from what today would be uh, Iraqi origin, from, uh, from, uh, from uh, Cairo, from, from the Maghreb, because this was the center. Everybody arrived here, a, a, fantastic, uh, a fantastic land where they could uh, grow anything. They brought things from all over the place uh, to Sicily. They produced, they, they imported the citrus fruit, 
They imported um, the silkworm. They imported uh, so many uh, pomegranates, so many things that today are obvious in Europe, and yet they did not exist until this cosmopolitan Islamic invasion and occupation of Sicily transformed this land uh, into an experiment, an agricultural experiment, a botanical experiment, an architectural experiment, a social experiment, and also into something which was a major success, a financial experiment of enormous success. And those who tell us, who prove to us this story, and who um, in fact give us the best description of this Mediterranean society in the era of the Fatimids, who inherited from the Aglabids all this wealth, all this quality, this fantastic embroideries, this wonderful tiras. The people who describe this in detail are the Jews, are the Jews of the Geniza. And uh, what is the Geniza? It is um, a series, an enormous series of letters and documents discovered in uh, <clears throat> a synagogue in Fustat a uh, hundred years ago, over a hundred years ago, uh, which were in part dispersed and then collected and uh, studied, carefully studied by a wonderful scholar, Professor Samuel Goitain uh, of uh, Yemeni Jewish origin, who devoted his entire lifetime to this fantastic search. And he examined thousands and thousands of letters Many of these were, in fact, um, uh, uh, writing to their families in Sicily, from Yemen, from, uh, from Cairo, from the, around the Mediterranean, from uh, the Maghreb. And uh, these documents are, in fact, he, he, after having studied them, he, he wrote six volumes called A Mediterranean Society. These six volumes are, I think, one of the most extraordinary documents that we do have. It's a, it's a, it's a declaration of love by Samuel Goiten. Uh, he tells us how magnificent this society was, where you didn't need passports, where you could travel everywhere. Uh, Sicilian coins were currency even in China. Um, our, um, the silk that was woven in Palermo, in the Tiraz of Palermo, ended up at the Kaaba. And uh, um, everything was exported around the Islamic world. Scholars, uh, ideas, uh, poems, and this fantastic uh, architecture. So I believe that all this has been deliberately, deliberately hidden. Not only uh, they have falsified history, there is at the moment um, an exhibition in Palermo, which instead of showing uh, uh, this aspect of our civilization, the, whole, the, the extraordinary influence of these uh, uh, series of Islamic rulers in Sicily, are trying to say that only the Normans brought civilization here. There was a, uh, last year an exhibition in London, which said exactly the same thing. And, um, and we, uh, in fact, uh, um, are, there are very few of us who have succeeded in getting this knowledge through. Uh, although it is obvious, because the documents are there, Goitin's work is, stands as a monument of proof of this. And the beauty of it is that it is something, a story written by others. It's a story written by the Jews of the Mediterranean, who tell us also this fantastic uh, world, this fantastic uh, horizontal world, where people uh, knew that they had to rely on others, other civilizations, other, other cultures, in order to produce their own culture. There were certain people who brought the copper from uh, India to Sicily, others who brought the coral from Sicily uh, to, <laughs> to somewhere else. Altogether, they were, the Armenians did certain kind of works, uh, the Jews did other kind of works. And in the end, you created art and architecture. And this beautiful, those magnificent, let me show you this. This is one of the masterpieces of the world. This is 
Rogers coronation mantle. This coronation mantle is one of the masterpieces of the world and uh, it is um, embroidered, entirely woven and embroidered in the Palermo Tiraz, which means that Islamic artisans created this mantle for a Norman king. And this mantle uh, is now in Vienna, in the Schatzkammer, in the treasury chamber of uh, the Royal Palace of Vienna, and was used for centuries and centuries as an installation mantle for the Holy Roman Emperor. And this is the proof of what happened then. Henry VI, the father of Frederick II, brought this back. He was so excited by this fantastic uh, um, piece of craft. In fact, there is a whole tunic under this, there are shoes and gloves. It is an absolute masterpiece. But for, for years and years before we fought to prove that it was created by Islamic craftsmen, whose name is in fact inside, is written inside, and that's how we managed to prove it, before it was considered as a Norman product. And still today, the, uh, the attitude is just that. The Normans were the ones who brought civilization to Sicily. Now we have to consider the complicated Mukarnas, the most, one of the most complicated um, pieces of architecture and uh, of craft uh, in Islamic art all over the world is the ceiling of the uh, chapel, which is in the Royal Palace of Palermo, the Palatina Chapel of Palermo. It is a masterpiece. Uh, it contains hundreds and hundreds of miniatures, which I am very convinced were painted by a group of um, Persian artists. It has many Persian symbols. It has uh, um, extraordinary, extraordinary decorations. Uh, they are above your head, so far up that you can't practically see them. Uh, and they are all painted on this stru stalactite structure, which is like, um, uh, as you, you understand what the Mukarnas are, but they're, they're, they're absolutely unique, unique. The structure is so complex that today, even today with a computer, it is very difficult to, uh, to, to make a project, uh, how to create it. So the question has always been, who did this? There were only, there was only, there were only the, 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 the Persian mathematicians of those days who could ever have produced this extraordinary structure. And then did they produce it for the king, for the Norman king? Did they produce it for the Fatimid ruler? And it was in the, in the Fatimid palace in town and then was taken away from there, dismantled and brought to the church, we will never know because there is no desire to discover truth. There is the wish to hide it. When UNESCO um, uh, decided to uh, approve a law considering the uh, Arab, so-called Arab Norman heritage of Sicily as a world heritage, what did they do? They started the date from 1060, which means from the conquest, the 200 years before, the moment of glory, the moment when this whole thing happened, were canceled. And we, I complained, I went to conferences, I tried to lecture, I tried to write, but nobody wants it. That's the story. The Normans then, and the Americans uh, with Operation Husky, of course, are the ones who liberate Sicily and turn it into some, something which they think is uh, civilization. Okay. You know, um, every word that you say sinks uh, in, into my spirit as, I, as I'm looking for many years for someone to talk about these issues. I'm not talking from a nationalistic point of view that the uh, Mugarnas or the miniatures were made by Persian artists because it's much, much greater than that. Um, we, know, we know that a very important part of history where knowledge was transferred, science was transferred, 
The science of agriculture, as I talked with you last time, was transferred. The <coughs> making of water channels, qanat, was brought at that time. Could you elaborate on that? Um, in fact, we tried to convince the UNESCO that the major uh, contribution to this incredible uh, art or civilization that we that they call Arab Norman, which is, as I told you, wrong because there is a lot of Persian in it and there is a lot of Byzantine. It's this unique, uh, um, multipolar society of uh, uh, medieval medieval Sicily. Well, we try to tell them that one of the major elements was were the canals. Palermo still has. Uh, miles and miles of canals. And they, canals and they are called canals they are not called falage as you call them in uh, in yemen or in uh, or in oman so they are of persian origin and that's and they are exactly built as the canals of persia and that's the way the uh, the whole irrigation system of the Concador, of the golden, um, the called the Concador, the golden valley of Palermo, called, it was golden because it was full of citrus fruits, oranges, uh, and uh, and lemons and uh, mandarins. So the whole irrigation system was um, came from Persia, and uh, it uh, enabled this, these uh, rough wadis which come uh, um, rushing down the mountains. There you have very steep mountains surrounding Palermo. And so these, ra these rush waters used to destroy the town, of course. Uh, what they succeeded in doing, and we, we know that from already from Cairo 1, they created these big basins, enormous lakes, and uh, at different heights on the uh, coming, on the feet of the mountain. And these lakes were filled by the Khanat, and at the same time, they created magnificent palaces on the lakes. So now the story goes that those palaces have been invented and created by the Norman kings. And how do you explain the Khanats? Well, nobody does explain it, but we just ignore them. Uh, um, although we suggested many times to set up a joint study with the um, Iranian Institute of Kanat, which is also under the auspices of UNESCO. And would, this would have been um, an important uh, study and research since there are many, many passionate scholars in Sicily who've been working on them, but they are very isolated because of course, uh, uh, nobody considers it an important element since it proves <laughs> some, foreign, some foreign influence, which is not Norman. And at the same time, um, we know that uh, this country uh, had had um, a fantastic influence on uh, the um, uh, the um, British uh, system. The British system was set up. The British government system, with its sheriffs, was set up by an employee of the Sicilian Norman Kingdom, and we know even who he was. And of course, the sheriff is nothing but sheriff. And uh, this is the place where they copied the diwan, that copied the structure, the complex, the very complex structure. You know how complex Fatimid uh, ruling system was. Uh, it was uh, it was extremely um, organized, well organized. Uh, the, the administration was uh, meticulous. And uh, this whole system inspired the Normans for the building up of an administration in England. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, Princess Victoria, I'm going to do something very strange now. I'm going to ask you a question in English, of course, as we're talking, but I want you to answer it in Arabic, uh, and I'm going to subtitle it in, in Farsi or in English. What? My question to you, and you, please answer it in Arabic. I want my audience to know what you know. Uh, when I visited the Church of Antioch, uh, when I was in Palermo, I was filming, and then my guide, who was a professor at Palermo, sh showed me the top of the pillars, the columns, and there was a wedding party going on. There was a wedding, uh, and on top, there were all Quranic inscriptions from the Middle Ages, 
from literally a thousand years ago. Now this is a church called the Church of Antioch, but no one, dis no one erased or scrubbed off the ayahs of the Qur'an on top of the church. Uh, so please answer that question in Arabic. Namu hadi al kanisa hi al yom kanisa ortodoxia. Leisat katolikia, walakin ortodoxia. Liana George al Antaki can can rajul min Antakia. Ata wasal ila sapalia min Tunis. Wa sar amiraglio, amir. البحر لل للملك الأول راجر الأول وهذا الرجل هو الذي عرف كل شيء عن التاريخ الإسلامي عن العلاقة بين الأديان عن عن النظام الفاطمي في 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 القاهرة هذا الرجل كان مثقف كان ايضا كان يعرف الاقتصاد كان يعرف الترتيب ترتيب الملوك كيف كيف يتصرفون الملوك في بيزانس كيف يتصرفون في القاهره النورمان هو هو علم الملك روجر كل شيء هو اتى بالثقافه الاسلاميه والبيزنطيه والتركيه من الشرق من مدينه انطاكيا وجاب كل هذا الى باليرمو وعندما توفي الملك صار مثل ما كان من قبل قتل الناس ناس كل شيء ناس العلاقة بين الأديان ناس التصرف الإسلامي مثلا كيف كيف كل دين يبقى يبقى في ترتيبه في الـ في الـ في التاريخ الاسلامي بعد الموت بعد ما مات جورج جانتاكيا روجر صار رجل من ملوك الغرب والمالك من نورماندية الذي يحارب الأديان ويقتل الناس عندما صار في الحرب إلى مهدية وفيليب فون فيليبو دي مهدية الأمير البحر الجديد قال للناس في مهدية أنتم نحن نحن لا نقتلكم إذ أنتم تتركون المدينة مدينة المهدية وهذا صار الناس الناس خرجوا من المدينة النورمان فيليبو دي مهدية مسك المدينة و لم يقتل حد في المدينة. عندما راجع إلى إلى باليرمو الملك روجر روجر الملك المشهور لل... لل... للعلاقة بين الأديان الملك روجر قتل فيليبو دي مهدية لأن لم يفهم إن لا... لا... لم يدرس شيء لم, ي... لم يتعلم شيء من جورج من جورج دانتياكيا لم يتعلم الترتيب ترتيب الهروب في 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 البحر المتوسط الترتيب عندنا مختلف من الترتيب في 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 الشمال هنا كل واحد يعني الجار عم من الدار نحن لا نقتل الجار نحن نحاول ان نعمل علاقه 
وسلام مع الجهار بعد الحرب هذا 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 الموضوع صار روجر الاول ناسيه بعد ما بعد ما مات جورج الانتاكي للاسف Uh, thank you so much, uh, Princess Victoria. This, this concludes my interview for now, but we have a lot to talk about. And uh, once we get this program through, we're going to be talking more. And I think there's a lot, lot that you have to say. Um, definitely, I haven't even covered your books. I haven't even covered why you're called Princess. I haven't covered that you live in a palace. I haven't covered that you've come from a monarchy of the Spanish Uh, descent and so many things remain for another program in the future but because our program is limited in time and we're going to be editing some things out I'm going to bid you farewell and thank you very much for sharing with us the, the knowledge that you have and what you've been contributing and you deserve to be heard very well in the western world and in the Islamic world especially in my country Well, uh, Nader, I am the one who thanks you because uh, I love your country and uh, it's a great opportunity for me to uh, remember the days when I was a young girl, a, a, a teenager, and I visited uh, Iran and I was impressed by its extraordinary, extraordinary civilization and its extraordinary population. So really a magnificent example of a, of a multicultural world that still resists nowadays. It is quite... A, quite unique so i am a great admirer <laughs> thank you thank you so much thank you, thank you. thank you for watching there remain many more questions that have to be asked from the princess we hope to have another chance until then farewell